Thank you for joining us today. My name is Nicole Webb, and we really hope the message today blesses you. If you'd like to know more about Liberty Church, please go online to lbcdublin.com. So welcome to church. My name is Nate, pastor here. It's an honor to have you today online or in the room. It's going to be a great day. already been a great service. Um, so if you get your Bible, we'll be in Acts 24, Acts 24, talking about the missed opportunity. The missed opportunity. So if you got your notes, you're filling the blank. You got those as you're handing in the white, white, red and white sheets. But uh, it's the title of the message, The Missed Opportunity. And so in Acts 24, we're going to see how a, a man missed an opportunity. And let me just take this moment real quick. If you've got kids in the room, K through 5th or in kids ministry, we really don't want them to miss the opportunity of being an adventure week. It's going to be a neat week. We're going to see lives change in our kids' ministry. Um, it's pretty incredible what's going on in our kids and our students. We've been calling it the next generation ministry, but we might have to change the name to the this generation ministry because they're just coming to know Christ and lives transforming. We've got two students at camp right now battling a call into ministry. And so lives are being changed in our this generation ministry, which we might be changing the name to that just because it's very fitting. So in Acts 24, uh, we see that Paul is on trial again. He's constantly on trial. He's in court and people are accusing him and he's getting blamed and the defense is coming at him and, and he's just trying to, trying to just live for Jesus. He's just trying to preach the gospel. And it kind, of, it kind of makes me think about our faith. Can you imagine being on trial every day for your faith? Can you imagine standing in the court of law and people are trying to say you're guilty of this, this, and this and all these false accusations would we be guilty of serving and loving the one true living God, Jesus Christ? It's just a question we've got to ask ourselves because ultimately when it comes down to it, we are on trial for our faith every day. I think about an NFL quarterback, every single play, every single step, every single move he makes is reviewed the next day in film. Every single thing that we do is, is seen by the one true living God, but also the people around us, our kids, our coworkers, our, the people in our lives, they just value what we do. And, and Paul is in the, the court of Jewish ridiculous judgment, but we're in the court of public opinion. And we want to be a people that are accused of serving and loving and living the name of Jesus Christ in everything that we do. Let's pray as we open up God's word. Father God, thank you so much for an opportunity to worship just naturally and just kind of raw. We thank you for what you're doing at camp and lives being changed. We pray that you continue to as tonight's the last night. Pray that you, those two that are battling a call to ministry, which is exactly what we were praying for, I pray that you just confirm that or deny that in their heart. Help them to know what you're calling them to do, not what they want to do. And Lord, I just pray for life change. Those that are getting baptized and changed, they just get plugged in to the next steps and they just grow in a relationship with you. Teach us through your word this morning. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. So we real quick recap from Acts 22 and 23, which we covered two weeks ago, is we were talking about how they were fighting over faith. And we talked about the peace wall in Ireland, and there's a divide between the Catholics and the Protestants. And so the, the church is at odds with one another. And we saw that in Acts 22 and 23 as well. And then we also talked about how there's an entourage of help and support that God provides when you stay the course of what God's called you to do. And today, we're today, as we said, we're talking about the missed opportunity. And the Jews in court today, they have a, they have a, a, a lawyer, and his name's Tert 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 Tertullus. He is a lawyer that is kind of given the argument against Paul, and he's making all these accusations that the Jews have brought to him. So we're catching up in verse 5 and 6 of Acts 24. Acts 24, 5 and 6 says this. For we have found this man to be a plague, an agitator among all the Jews throughout the Roman world, and a ringleader of the sect of Nazarenes. He even tried to desecrate the temple, so we apprehended him. So Tertullus, sorry, I've got to say that name slow. Tertullus, goodness, accused Paul of being four different things. First of all, he calls him a plague. Has anybody ever been called a plague? Don't answer that question if you have. It's not very encouraging. Like if somebody called me a plague, I'd be like, out of all the words to describe me, that's the word you think of? Like I'm that bad, I'm a plague. Like that's just not very encouraging. In the NIV, it says troublemaker. In the amplified version, it says a public menace. Reminds me of Spider-Man. So apparently Paul is like Spider-Man to these Jews at this time. Second thing he calls him, it says you're an, he was an agitator among the Jews 
Third thing, it says he's a ringleader of the sect in the, the New Living Translation. For the word sect, it says occult. And that's what I thought that word meant, but I just kind of dug into it a little bit more. And so he's basically saying he's the leader of this cult that they call Christians here. And so he's saying all that. And then it says he tried to desecrate the temple. So three charges or violations that he's bringing against him at this time that Tertullus, the lawyer, is bringing against him. First of all, is a violation of Roman law. And so when you go against the Roman law, you are like destined for death. You're going to be killed for whatever you're trying to do. If you've seen the show, The Chosen, and I've encouraged you to watch it, it's a great show. One of the things they depict very well is whenever Jesus has a group of people that are gathered and they get in the way of the streets or kind of disrupting the city, even though it's a good thing, the Romans were furious and like, we've got to stop this. We can't have this. Traffic has to flow. They did not like you disrupting the Roman culture because they wanted control. And if they didn't have control, they'd want to control it. Second thing was a violation violation of Jewish law, and then a violation of God's law, which is a destruction of the temple. And so he's accused of several things that he didn't do. One of the things I've noticed about Paul, as we've been studying the book of Acts, is he never really complained or whined that people were confusing him things. And so when I get accused of something, I typically make a defense. Well, I didn't do that, or she did that, or we make different arguments about ourselves that like, hey, we're not guilty. Like, we didn't do that. And you can say that about me, but we didn't do that. Paul didn't really like argue their accusations. He'd make a simple statement kind of referencing the Old Testament that would kind of prove his point, but he'd never sit there and say, that wasn't me, I didn't do that, and start arguing and whining about his situation, which is a lot of times what I or we do at times. And so don't feel alone when you get accused of something, because remember, Paul got accused a lot, and he was faithful to Jesus. And then once again in court, he turned opposition into opportunity. We've talked about that a lot, to share God's message. So verse 14 and 15, Paul is responding. He says, but I admit this to you. I worship the God of my ancestors according to the way, which they call a sect or a cult in another version, believing everything that is in accordance with the law and written in the prophets. I have a hope in God which me, these men themselves also accept that there will be a resurrection both of the righteous and the unrighteous. So Paul demonstrated something that we can learn from daily. Different crowd, same message. Different crowd, same message. When you, when you dig into Paul's life, no matter who he was in front of, he preached the same message and he lived the same life. I just think that's such a great example for us today because there's a lot of times when we're in front of different people that we just act a little different. I'm not saying we act like heretical or crazy or anything like that, but we just act different in front of that crowd. We might do things differently in front of that crowd compared to maybe how we act on Sunday morning. An example that I thought of was a, an evangelist from the 80s and early 90s. I remember watching them and being like, their hair is just a little bit too perfect. You know what I'm saying? And, and I feel like all pastors should just be bald, but that's a whole nother point. Um, <laughs> And so, and so I remember watching them and I'd be like, man, their, their outfits are just, they're just so perfect. Like I've never seen a pastor look like that. And I didn't really prefer it. And I was a kid, not really understanding a new Christian, but I just didn't really understand. It seemed like, it kind of seemed like they were fake, fake. It seemed a little icky, if you know what I'm saying. That was the judgment coming out of me. Well, long story short, this man that I'm referring to, and he was living two lives and he was stealing money from the church and he wasn't living a life that represented Christ. And, and you saw his life and you're like, okay, well, that makes sense. He was preaching one message and living another. Well, that wasn't Paul. With Paul, private life and public life were equal. Different crowds, same message, it was consistent. He lived one life, and I think it's such a great example for us because he preached Jesus and him crucified to anyone and to everyone, no matter who the crowd was. Reminds me of Sherman Smith we talked about last week. Throw that picture up on the screen from Father's Day. You may remember a quick glimpse of the story, but if you weren't here last week, Sherman Smith, Smith was D. Lynn, the guy on the left, his coach for 28 years, mentor and coach for 28 years of his life. Almost three decades, I think is the time frame. Well, long story short, he was adopted, D. Lynn was adopted, and he didn't even realize that that was his birth father that was his coach and mentor for 28 years of his life. It's a crazy story. I encourage you to look it up after, <clears throat> after this. If you didn't hear last week, but it's just an incredible story. So one of the things about Sherman is he's a, he's a passionate believer and he speaks at churches. And I was listening to one of his talks. Listen to what he said. This might rock your world because I can't imagine somebody saying this to me, but he's telling the story. A mentor Christian said to me, this is what he's saying that someone said to him, stop telling people you're a Christian. Well, that's not very encouraging. You're making it tough on the rest of us that are trying to live for Christ. 
ouch. He didn't buck up, so Sherman goes on to tell the story. He says that he didn't buck up because he knew it was true. And he said to him, the man said to him, his mentor man said to him, said, don't you know who you are? You're a child of God. And I just love that example because it's kind of savage and kind of crazy and kind of abrasive for a man to say to another Christian, but I kind of wish we all had mentors like that. They really call this out when we're living one way, one place, and another play, way, another place. Or we're saying one message in one place and speaking another message somewhere else. Like we need somebody to say, hey, stop claiming Christ if you're going to live two Christs, two, two lives. And, and that's a, that, I need somebody in my life that's going to speak that way at times because we all need to be called out for our life. And that was, that was Paul, but different crowds, same message. I had a friend in college. He was a former University of Louisville basketball player, and I went to the University of Louisville. His name was Brian Kaiser. He led FCA at the University of Louisville. Amazing man of God. Well, everywhere we went, I spent a lot of time with him, and everywhere we went, he's always preaching the gospel. He's always telling people about Jesus, no matter where we are, no matter who we're with. It could be a pizza delivery guy. It could be somebody in the student activity center. And frequently I'm like, hey man, can we, can we speed this up? I gotta get to class. And I can imagine some response he says like, which is more important, Jesus? For this guy getting Jesus or you're being gotten time to class? And I'm like, I don't wanna answer that question because he's just gonna judge me. But he constantly preached the message of Jesus everywhere he went. Everywhere he went, same message, same lifestyle to anyone. So back to verse 15, this is him lightly defending himself. This is Paul defending himself after he's living with a different crowd in the same message. It says this, I have a hope in God. Pretty simple. I have a hope in God. Paul's defense was my only hope is God and his only hope is Jesus. His only hope is Jesus. There's no other hope. There's no other defense. My only hope is God. And I hope and pray that we can be a people that no matter what's going on, no matter what our circumstances are, no matter how gifted we are with our jobs or talented we are with our mind and our mentality and emotional strength and parenting and making money and career and all that, that we still fall back on our only hope is in God, which he's crying out. And so as we continue back in this passage, we catch up with Paul, and he's on house arrest in the governor's palace. So the governor's Felix. He's the king of Judah. But here's the crazy thing about Felix as we break into verse 24 in just a second. Felix is the governor, and he came and conversed with him regularly, which it says at the end of this passage. But here's the crazy thing about the governor of Judah, which is huge land, Judea, excuse me, Judea. He's got tremendous influence, but Felix was actually born a slave. So he was born the lowest of low, and he's, he's actually now like a king, he's a governor, he's royalty. He, he was a cruel ruler, and his name brought, um, alone brought fear to people. He killed thousands of Jews and Gentiles. And so this man that is hanging out with Paul was accused of, well, he did, he killed thousands of Jews and Gentiles. So he could have killed Paul at any minute. Like, he didn't care. He's like, I'm, I'm, if I'm going to kill you, I'm going to kill you. Nobody's going to judge me because I'm the king, essentially. And so let's catch up in this verse, chapter 24, Acts 24, verses 24 to 26. Several days later, when Felix came with his wife, Drusla, we'll talk about that in a second, who was Jewish, she sent for Paul and listened to him on the subject of faith in Jesus Christ. Now, as he spoke about righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come, Felix became afraid and replied, leave for now. But when I have an opportunity, I'll call for you. The, N the NIV, I'm reading the CSB. The NIV says, when I find it convenient, I will send to you, send for you. Verse 26, at the same time, he was also hoping that Paul would offer him some money. So he sent for him quite often and conversed with him. So I talked about at the beginning, he brought his wife, Drusilla. And so here's the thing about his wife. So he convinced this young lady, and she's apparently, according to history, she's about 19 years old. She was already married to another man, but he used money and influence to drag her away from her husband. She divorced them, and she married this man. So he's already ruining marriages and everything. He's all about money. He's a crazy dude. But let me tell you about this woman, which is just crazy. Quite a quality family line we got going on here. She's the daughter of King Herod Agrippa, the first who killed the apostle James. Her grandfather killed the babies in Jerusalem when Jesus was born and they're killing all the babies. That was her grandfather. Her great uncle beheaded John the Baptist. And so she has a pretty strong family line of killing Christians right here. So Paul is hanging out with a mass murderer of Jews and Gentiles, and he's a Jew and now a Christian. And then his wife, her family line is killing influential Christians that he's known and studied and taught about on a regular basis. And so he's in front of an, a, a pretty intimidating audience 
different crowd, same message. His hope was in the Lord. He wasn't trying to win him over to get him out of house arrest or out of jail. He was trying to win him over to Jesus. And it's such a great example for us because in verse 26, the second part of the verse, it says, so he sent for him quite often and conversed with him. I love this because it's like the governor is just hanging out with a prisoner. Like you don't see that very often. You don't see the president of the United States or the governor of a state going and just hanging out with a prisoner on a regular basis. So he, said, he talked about three different things with him. He talked about righteousness, self-control, and judgment to come. And if those things are progressive in nature, there's a reason they were because first of all, righteousness, it's the absolute standard of God's holy nature. We have to be right before God. And Jesus set that example, but that's coming with judgment. So righteousness and self-control is man's response to bring him to conform him to God's law. So we have to have righteousness, but we have to self-control to bring us to a point of righteousness. And the third thing he talked about was the judgment to come, which is the inevitable result of not living up to God's standards. So you have to be right before God. You have to be self-controlled to choose right before God. And if you don't do that, then judgment's gonna come and you're gonna spend eternity in a real place called hell. That's basically what he's saying to him. Like, wow, like, Paul, you skipped a few steps. What about like, hey, Jesus loves you and he died on the cross for you and God's got a plan for your life. What about messages like that? Why wouldn't he communicate that? And I find that very interesting because sometimes that's where I go to. I like to talk about the love of God. I like to talk about the love of Jesus. He's in his son, John 3, 16. We know that very well. But to not talk about the judgment of God is doing a disservice to a new believer or a potential convert. Because when you understand the reality of a place called heaven that is perfect and streets of gold and there's no more pain, no more suffering, no more tears, no more death, and we worship God for the rest of eternity, and it's perfect. We got to understand that. But we also got to understand that there's a real place called hell, which is eternal torment and pain and suffering and the the suffering never ends. Like we have to understand that and we really got to communicate that as well. And someone was like, someone might say, well, why would you talk about this to a new believer that's not loving? And, And I would even argue that it's not loving to neglect the truth of a heaven and hell and someone that needs Jesus. And when you study Jesus, he talked about hell more than anybody else. So if Jesus talks about it, then we should too. You know, William Booth, the founder of Salvation Army, he stated this, I thought this was pretty wise. He said, if I were God, which obviously he's not, so don't accuse him of that. If I were God, I would make every Christian spend 15 seconds of hell in hell. Then they would be on the doorsteps pleading with people to be saved. Wow. Like, I I don't think about it like that. But he says, if we believe what we believe about hell, then if we spent 15 seconds there, it would change our world and we'd tell everybody about the reality of a heaven and hell. Because here's the thing, when you understand the reality of a heaven and a hell, and this is your fill in the blank, when you understand the reality of a heaven and hell, it changes your perspective on the life that you're living and it changes your perspective on the people around you and you begin to see them in the eternal state that they are. Like for instance, Instead of going up to someone and just having a conversation like, hey, what do you do? Tell me about your kids, tell me about your family, stuff like that. And that's surface, general conversation, getting to know somebody. I understand that. So don't hear me negating that. I do the same thing and I'll continue to do the same thing. But instead of only thinking about that, we should be as Christ followers and understanding the, the, the reality of a heaven and a hell, we should be thinking, okay, does this person know Jesus and they're gonna spend eternity with God? Or do they not know Jesus and and they need Jesus? Because if not, they're gonna spend eternity separated from God in a real place called hell. We should be thinking like that. And it's hard to think like that, but but when you understand the theology of a heaven and a hell, it's it's, it's honestly hard not to tell others about Christ because you see it and you get it and you understand it and you understand the seriousness, seriousness, seriousness of it. And, And here's the thing, if you've ever... Like in medicine, if you're a doctor or a nurse, or maybe you've been on an airplane, you've been in the, the room when this is happening. In fact, let's do a little crowd response time. How many of y'all have been in the room when someone is about to take their life last breath, or if you don't do something, then they will die? How many of y'all have ever been, oh my goodness, all over the room? First service, it was a couple dozen. It seems like at least three or four dozen right here. It's incredible. It's a moment. It's scary. Like you have to fight. I'll never remember the time that that happened in my life. I'm not a doctor. Don't, don't worry about it. Um, maybe one day somebody will give me a doctorate. That's probably the only doctorate that I'll ever earn. But uh, so I'm, I'm in a room and we're at camp. And you're like, death almost happened at camp. Like, what in the world is going on? Let me get to the end of the story before you freak out. So my, my closest friend, Nick, he came and preached about seven months ago here on this stage. Amazing man of God. 
We're sitting there in a room and we're staying in like a cabin with about 10 other pastors. It's a pretty big church. We've got a huge student ministry, so we're all just kind of hanging out. And we, we wake up pretty early and everybody's kind of waking up slowly, just tired, been up all night dealing with students at camp and so having a good time. And then we get up, it's probably 7 a.m. or something, and Nick is kind of like moaning and mumbling. And so we kind of joke with him like, ah, Nick's tired, get up, Nick. And then he keeps moaning and mumbling. And, and we're like, Nick, get up, man. We gotta go. And so everybody's getting ready and he's still moaning. And we're like, what is going on? And so I go over to the bed and I'm like, guys, he's not responding. And so we're freaking out because he's a di he's diabetic, type one diabetic. And if he doesn't get sugar in his system quickly, he could die. Because his blood sugar was going extremely low. And so we are freaking out. So he starts mumbling low. So we're thinking maybe on the bottom of the cabin on the first floor, he's got jelly packets that you can put in your gum. It goes straight to your bloodstream. Maybe he's got jelly packets. And so we're ripping through all his luggage, looking through, where, where is it, where is it? There's 10 of us freaking out, throwing stuff everywhere. And let me just tell you, in those moments, you think you get supernatural strength because that's what happens in movies and like you see it on YouTube and stuff. Well, Nick's a heavy set guy because he's like a bodybuilder. He's massive. I tried to lift him up and put him on the floor. It didn't happen. Didn't have supernatural strength. And, and so we're like fighting, doing everything. And then Adam, one of our staff members, jumps on the four-wheeler because they're about a mile from civil because we're up in the mountains and scattered all over the place for camp. He goes and picks up the nurse. She jumps on the back of his four-wheeler. He breaks the camp rules of a guy being on the four-wheeler with a girl, but it didn't matter. She shows up. She's got a jelly packet, puts it on his gums. Immediately, his life's, life's saved. It was scary as all get out. But when you understand life and death like that, that if you don't do something, then their life's gonna be over, it's scary. Like, it, it, it changes you. When you understand that if you don't do something about it, that somebody could spend an eternity in a real place called hell, it's scary. It changes you. And, and honestly, that's why, like, some people might come to our church and be like, man, y'all spend a lot of money, time, and effort, and staff trying to reach this community for Christ. Like, it's, it's a little extra. Well, I don't apologize about that because people need Jesus. And I want us to be the hope in a clear and concise way where people understand the message of the gospel and they give their life to Christ and they walk in obedience of baptism and they live out the calling that God has on their life. That's why we're so passionate for one more because there are people in this community dying and gonna spend a, excuse me, eternity in a real place called hell and that's not okay on my watch. I wanna see lives change and that's what I want us to be a people of that are serious about life change. And that's who we have to be. And that's why we're so serious about it because there's a desperation to save someone's life when you're sitting in that room. And there should be a desperation to save someone's life that you don't know where they're gonna spend eternity. And so the most loving thing you can do for someone in this is save their life by sharing Christ with them. And I don't want anybody to experience that. So back to verse 25, if you got your Bible. Now as he spoke about righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come, we talked about those three things. This is interesting. It says, Felix became afraid. Felix became afraid. Now that's pretty interesting because you got the royalty, you got the governor that's scared of the prisoner. That should not be the case because the prisoner is probably in chains. But he became afraid in that moment. So it's, it's crazy to think about because he, he understood something. He wasn't righteousness, he wasn't self-controlled, and so therefore judgment's coming for this brother. And he understood that and he got scared. It's a little bit of a role reversal because he's the one scared, not the prisoner. And, and here's the thing about Paul. Paul was an educated man. And so he knew a lot about the Jewish law. He was a Pharisee of Pharisees. You go over his resume of all the things that he did when he was younger and studying and everything. But he was just a simple guy. He really wasn't. He's a prisoner at this point. So he's definitely not a fancy guy or anything. But he was scared of spending time with him. It reminds me of Acts 4, 13 when some Jews were hanging out with the disciples. In verse 13, it says, when they observed the boldness of Peter and John, they realized they were just uneducated and untrained men. They were amazed and recognized they had been with Jesus. Because when you get with Jesus, people experience a taste of a living God. And people understand that because it doesn't matter your education. It doesn't matter your training. I've got a master's degree in the Bible and theology and all that. Guess what? None of that matters. Because when you get with Jesus and you spend time in his word, you're gonna overflow the spirit of God in people's lives. And, and sometimes they're, they're gonna be kind of stunned, confused, and sometimes they're gonna be afraid. I remember in college, I was in the student activity center. I walked in and I just, I'm just filled with joy. I just spent time with the Lord. I was praying for about an hour and just spent about 20 minutes reading. I'm just, I'm just fired up. I think I'm even kind of jumping around. And some people came up to me and they're like, what's wrong with you? And I was like, I don't know. I just, 
I'm just really happy I spent time with Jesus. I don't know if that's weird to you, but that's, that's kind of where I am right now. And, and they said, okay, that's weird. And they kind of walked off. And it was, it's kind of a joke. But the truth is, like, the Spirit of God was overflowing out of my life. And people experience that, and that's what can happen. And, and I don't know if you've ever been around someone godly, but sometimes you get around somebody godly and you, you feel like you're doing something wrong. Like you feel like you're not holy enough, if you know what I'm saying. Uh, it's like you'll say something like, hey, and so the other day, and I was, um, and then you might say the word shoot. And you're like, oh, I'm sorry, is that a bad word? And you're like apologizing for something that's not even a big deal. And you're like, oh, shucks, oh, is, is that a bad word? Like, I'm, I'm so sorry, I, sh I shouldn't have said that in your presence. And they're like, what are you talking about? Like, I'm just a human as well, but you, you just experience something out in their life and you see something in your life that you actually feel conviction yourself of the things in your life. I mean, the same thing happened in Exodus when, when Moses descended from Mount Sinai, he, his face shone with the glory of God, Acts 34, 30. It said, when Aaron and the Israelites saw Moses, the skin of his face shown, and they were afraid to come near him. And that's a little bit of what Felix is experiencing right now. He's hearing about the judgment of God. He's hanging out with a guy that's been with Jesus. And so this is what I encourage you with this. Get with God so that when you get with others, they will encounter the work of a living God in your life. When you get with God so that you, when you get with others, they will encounter the work of a living God in your life. Because sometimes we, we sit there and we're like, Man, I want, a, I want a word from God. Like, I got, a, I got a word from God. And I want to be honest with you, God's got something for you every single day. His mercies are new every single morning. Joy comes in the morning. Guess what? God's got something for you every single day. And, and a lot of times, I've heard Christians, especially the, like college age around this time, there's some college ministry, and they're like, I want a word from God today. I want a word. You don't need a word. You've got the word. And, and, and when you study the word, you're going to get the word inside of you and it's gonna change you from the inside out. And so I wanna encourage you, get with God so that when you get with others, they will encounter the work of a living God in your life. And the next verse, verse 25b, which I kind of just read a little bit of this, it's one of the saddest verses in the entire scriptures because this man just missed an opportunity. This is what he says. And this is the NIV that I'm reading right here. As Paul talked about righteousness, self-control and judgment to come, Felix was afraid and said, that's enough for now, you may leave. When I find it convenient, I'll send it for you. He's saying, I had enough. What you're saying, yeah, it sounds true, and I'm starting to feel bad for my life and conviction and all that stuff, but I don't really like the way you're going with this. I don't like the judgment thing, and I mean, yeah, whatever. You know what, just go on. When I find the convenient, I'll send with you. And then he continued to send for him on a regular basis. And let me just say this, and let me encourage you, inspire you, challenge you, convict you, whatever it may be. And this, this, this might be hard for you, but I want you to hear this. Don't put off God. Don't put off God. Because if he's, if he's calling you to salvation, to surrender your life to Christ, you don't want to miss the opportunity as, as Felix did, because Felix had everything, and then he probably spent eternity separated from God. We don't know the rest of his story, so I'm reading into it a little bit. And he realized that he thought he had everything, but he actually had nothing, and now he ultimately has nothing for an eternity. And, and when we put off things, we typically don't do them. Like at my house, typically my wife will say, hey, babe, will you do the dishes, wash the car, mow the lawn, whatever, you know, some um, not very important things like feed the kids because they're starving, yeah, whatever. Um, but she says those, and then I respond with three words. Let's see if you can finish the phrase. I will can anybody tell me? I will. Somebody said never. Not never. <laughs> I think one of these people said it. I will later. Later. Thank, thank you. So he's like, later. I got it. Later. And let, let me just, ladies, let me give you, a, let me tell you what that means. I absolutely have full intention of thinking about everything that you're telling me to do. And I really want to do it. But the reality is not only will I not do it later, I never will but I expect you to love me just the same because I love you. That's ultimately what men are thinking when they say, I will later, you know what I'm saying? And men are like, why would you tell that? That's the truth. Like it's, <laughs> it, it's kind of the truth. So I, 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 would, I would encourage you, try not to say I will later because he, he, he missed it. He ultimately missed his opportunity. When God calls, he calls. And, and as a Christian, when you're doing the work of God, later is not in your vocabulary. And so I would encourage you, forget later and focus on now, whatever God's calling you to do. Thank you so much. I appreciate that, Pastor Chris. 
And so I wanna encourage you, think about that. When you're doing the work of God, later is not in your vocabulary. You know, I hear people say all the time, I will later, I'll get right with God later. When I graduate from high school, when I graduate from college, when I get a family, when my kids get out of school, I'll, I'll get it right later. And, and it's important not to do it later because we don't know what later holds. We don't know what tomorrow holds because when God calls, God calls. And Felix missed it. And I wanna encourage you, if God's calling you to do something right now, do it. Don't think about it, just do it. Because there could be something that you've been meditating on for a long time or contemplating on of the decision that you need to make. Don't think about it anymore. If God's calling you to do it, do it. And there could be some of you in this room that say, you know what, I, I don't really have a relationship with God, but I, I've been putting this off for a long time and I need to do it. And, and let me just say this before we finish up. Finish up. And this is heavy, and I, I hope you can hear it as a Christian. This is kind of a, a calling out thing, kind of like that man did for Sherman. But I just want to say this to every single one of us. Because we say a lot, I'm too busy. I will later. I'll, I'll go to church later. I will. I'm, I'm too busy. Whatever we say, we say a lot of things like that. Thank God. Thank God that he wasn't too busy for us when he died on the cross for us. Because if he did get too busy we wouldn't be able to counter God. We wouldn't have a home in heaven when we die when we surrender our life to Christ. Thank God he didn't do that. And some of us are putting off the things of God that he's called us to do. And, and many of you know what that is and I encourage you to do that. Everybody bow your head and close your eyes. You know, God didn't put us off when he died on the cross. And let's be a church, let's be a people, a group of people that don't put God off when he calls us. You know, he came to this earth, as you know the story. He put on flesh. He lived a perfect life. He died in our place. And God's judgment put all the sin of the world on Jesus Christ. And he died in our place. He took your place. He took my place. And he died on the cross for us. And he came to this earth, he died, he resurrected for you and for me. And he has been chasing us all along. And so right now, if you just say, if you just sit here in this place right now and you say, you know what, honestly, Pastor Nate, I, I, I've been putting it off long enough and I need to surrender my life to Christ. I need to give my life to him because I don't know if I would die today that I'd go to heaven. And if that's you, then I wanna encourage you to pray this prayer right now and surrender your life to Christ. Don't put off God in this moment. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, I know I've sinned but you died on the cross for me. I give you my past, my present, my future. I no longer put you off. I give you my life. I step off the throne of my life and I put you first. In Jesus' name, every head bowed and every eye closed. Now, if you made that decision, would you just roll, real quickly, real simply, until I acknowledge your side of the room, would you just slide your hand up in there and say, you know what, that's me. I just gave my life to Christ for the first, the last, the only time. I'm no longer gonna put God off. Okay. Anybody else? Is that you in the back? Awesome. Okay, and if you made that decision, then right now in this moment, you can actually talk to someone about this to make sure that you understand the decision that you're making. And so when we stand up and sing for just a quick moment, you can go to the back of the room and talk to one of our prayer partners because they would love to just encourage you and help you understand what this means. And there'll be a couple of them back there just to talk to you. Or maybe you just need prayer and somebody's just to pray over you. They're there to pray for you as well. Let's cry out to God as we finish up this message. Father God, we thank you so much for an opportunity to see a man that just missed it. He had the opportunity, but he just missed it. Lord, I pray that whenever you're calling us to do something, that we don't miss it. And that we allow our hope to be in you and in you alone, not anything that we do or anything, but that you died on the cross for us. And that's our identity, that's everything. And Lord, I just pray that we just, just look at Paul's example as we have for several weeks and will for a couple more weeks. And we'll try to live in obedience to you and everything. We pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Let's stand. Here.